Hello and welcome to the 33 Ways Not to Screw Up podcast. So this is the book series podcast to help steer you clear of business pitfalls. And I'm your host, Alistair McDermott, and I'm here with my co-host, Melissa Wilson. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. And our guest, Anne Janzer. So um, let's let's uh, dive straight into it. So this is called the 33 Ways Not to Screw Up podcast. Melissa, you are the publisher of this series. Can, can you give a little bit of context to what this is all about? Yes, I, through the years, have published so far in the last 11 years, over 160 books by thought leaders. And what came to me last year was why not focus on a series? I know Amazon had developed a, um, a new offering, which was to identify books that were part of a series. And I thought it would be especially uh, a, a strong opportunity to create something that offered value as a series. And I have been watching the Dummy series uh, for a number of years. One of my colleagues, and he was an editor of mine when I was traditionally publishing, he had been there when IDG started the Dummy series. And I also know a lot about the Chicken Soup for the Soul. So I thought maybe we can create something that's by different thought leader experts focused on business. And actually, Alistair, when I was on your show, you had said to me, boy, this would be great if it was just focused on business. And I thought about it since my first book was a business book focused on starting businesses in Chicago, where I come from. And so I committed to that then. You said, if, if you're going to focus only on business, I'm in. And so... You got to participate in this series too. And uh, it, very, very exciting. Everything happened truly very magically because Anne came in for the first four books that came out. And in one year, we've ended up with 11 books. There are some that are coming around the turn, the turn from 22 to 23. But there's such an interest in these books and how useful they are. And so I'm I'm pleased that 11 books are ready now uh, and, and coming, I think all of them are out except one. And I'm even planning an anchor book that will talk about how not to screw up writing a book series. And so it's- Very it's meta. An, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's that's going to be the 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 jump off point for a lot of people because obviously I advocate for that. But the most important thing to note about the these books is it's all the stuff and not the fluff. Mm -hmm. And I'm very pleased that that's the case. And we hope to continue up into more than a hundred books. But the other unique thing that we will talk about, I'm sure, more often than not. There's never been a book series that I know of where all the authors help each other. And that right. has happened. And it's very exciting. Everyone's giving. The authors are supporting each other. And because I would write most of my books when I did my first 15 or so, um, it was all about networking. Mm -hmm. And the best thing you can do with the network is have a supportive network. So that's it's yeah. the full circle around this series. And you get that compounding effect. And and even here, as, as we discuss this, I, I wrote a book for this series because I had Anne on my show. And yes. Anne came on my podcast. I interviewed <laughs> Anne, I talked to her, and she said, hey, you should get Melissa on your show. And then Melissa, you came on, and then, then we spoke, and I said, hey, I could write a book, book for that. So so yeah, the, the connections, it's um it, it, it the, the networking impact is is super. So so Anne, let, let's talk a little bit. You're like you're a super prolific author. Um how many books have you written at this point? Uh well, so this was my sixth book. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first five were indie. So mm -hmm. um to do something different, you know, Melissa reached out to me with this one and said, uh, you know, would you want to be part of this? And I just published my fifth book not you know, a few months before. So I'm like, ah, oh, Melissa, I'm not ready. You know, I'm not ready to take on another book. Um, but as she kept talking and I kept thinking about it, 
I'm like, you know, this sounds really fun and different. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I <laughs> came back to her. It's like, yes, I'm in. Uh, I'd written a bunch of books about, I'd written a book about marketing. I had a marketing career. I'd written a, my other four of them were about writing, deep dives into writing. I've written about business writing. So I'm like, well, what's the fundamental small atomic unit there that I can use to make a small, really impactful book? And it's like business emails. That's the topic because we cannot escape them. We all do them. If I can write a book that helps, you know, a number of people make an incremental improvement in how emails work in their business life, I've done something good in the world. <laughs> yeah. And, and you actually asked me, you contacted me and said, hey, do you have any screw up uh, around email? So I'm, I'm not going to say which it is, but one, one, of, one of those stories is, is a true story from uh, my my past uh, when I was a young uh, young guy working in a, in a, in a corporation. So uh, I made a big screw up, but I got away with it, thankfully. <laughs> You got away with it. That's right. But, yeah. you know, wouldn't we rather learn off of each other's mistakes? And so, yeah. so the, the title that Melissa created for this series, you know, 33 ways not to screw up, you know, that just accelerated so much. First of all, it gave me this structure. It, it told me I'm going to write about, you know, I, I'm going to have 33 chapters at least plus an intro and a, and a background. It's going to be super actionable. It's going to, um, uh, and I like the idea of just saying what to do. I like the idea of learning from mistakes. So part of my research for this was just reaching out to my community of writers and saying, you know, hey, want to share anonymously, if you like, your, you know, most embarrassing email mistake so that someone else doesn't have to suffer it. <laughs> so that, starting with the series idea, starting with the, even the title, it just accelerated my writing process. I'll spend a year twiddling around with approaches and titles and what should the book be and who should the audience be. And instead, I just got to start with the research and the fun. And um, so it was a really different writing experience for me, but I really enjoyed it. You know, it was. A, yeah, it was I, I, I found the same, actually. Um, I, I wrote it really quickly because the title was set in stone. Like I couldn't change that. And so I have to write to this title. And and so it ended up being being quite quick. Um, yeah. And I think I think that is um, that's an interesting kind of meta point about this about mm -hmm. this whole thing. So I don't know, Melissa, yeah. did, did did is is that something that a lot of people have found, or is that something you've yes you know? yes it it really it really has made a difference, and it's what I wanted to do through the years of being um, a book coach and helping people create books. That has been a real um, roadblock for many authors because having a title, a catchy title, a title that will sell, uh, it's it takes them a long time many times to get the right title. Like I said, you know, this book has momentum because I wanted to be a little bit edgy. There are a lot of books with the F word in there. And I'm, I'm constantly surprised by how many reviews they get. Uh, I think people out there, it must be to me, one of my assumptions is readers want you to tell it like it is. So this book is the real, you know, the, the real skinny on and anything dealing with, with the niches in business. So that's helpful. Plus studies show that books are getting shorter. So 33 ways, we're usually looking at about 20,000 words, except when people decide it's got to be longer. And then I give them that, I say, sure, whatever. But for the most part, it is a plane ride book. And I think people more and more appreciate having that satisfaction of really learning something in a shorter period of time. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm interested then, um, so Anne, when you, when you were writing your book, and, and it was one of the first, so you didn't really have the same guidelines that I did when I, I came along. I, I think mine was the 10th book. Um, so there was a kind of a, a body of work out there. I could, I, I bought your book and I, so I went <laughs> through it so that I could uh, figure out what I was writing. Um, did, did you, did you find it pretty easy to write it? It was did it just flow. Uh, it, I found it, it was pretty easy to write. I mean, I always 
you know, I, at this point, I've, I've worked a lot of my writing process, but it certainly accelerated the process for me. I spent some time, I always spend time in research. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the biggest issue, at first I thought, well, 33 is going to be a tall number to reach. And then, of mm -hmm. course, I ended up, nope, won't fit in, won't, that chapter's Gotta on the floor. These, yeah. <laughs> it's like, there's a lot of ways you can screw up emails, it turns out. Um, so it was interesting. The things I thought would be hard weren't. The challenge was keeping it, you know, I wanted to have stories in there mm -hmm. because that's, that's how we learn, you know, and I wanted to have a little research in there. And yet I wanted to keep, I was, I was shooting for that 20,000 words, Melissa. I really, really was. I think I got <laughs> it under there. And um, that took a lot of revision and to craft to, to, to keep it down. It down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's kind of where the, the challenge sat there is being restrained on what I wanted to do. But can you, can I do you love us? having a short book. Can you tell us um, who, so who are you aiming this book at? Like, who is it really useful for? So really, I, I'm thinking two groups of people. One is all of us who have been just doing email the same way for, you know, however long. And as the world becomes more virtual, more virtual teams, we're actually doing more stuff on email than we used to. Um, so that's just sort of all of us, that not all of us, every everyone who's working as a knowledge worker, collaborating with clients, customers, team members. And then I think, too, it's really useful for people just entering the workforce, perhaps from college, where they come with a different set of, you know, social media <laughs> expectations. And so there's a cultural shift in how do you communicate with your peers um, over email? And there's some slightly different norms, and those things are changing and shifting. And so I think it's very, very interesting to look at that. That was one of the bits of, of research that I thought was really fun was how, you know, even grammar from social media and texting is different than grammar from the traditional world of print and emails kind of smack in the middle there. Right. So mm -hmm. it's, it was, it's, I, obviously I, I kind of go off on researching things. That's, that's my, so, my burden. <laughs> I, I, I can just imagine some, um, some boomers uh, buying hundreds of copies of these for their millennial uh, um, new, <laughs> <Okay. colleagues, laughs> new employees. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So um, can I ask what's your favorite screw up story from the book? Oh, you know, I had so many that I had to lead a lot out. So I'm going to share one that didn't make the book. Um, and because it just, I think, took too much time to space to explain. Um, a friend of mine was a very senior technical person at a small organization. And the company had recently hired a new CTO, who was in charge of the whole IT stack. Uh, and he was working on a, a different thing. But my, my friend was like not impressed with some of the things the CTO was doing. So he wrote a long, thoughtful email to the CEO about, you know, I really, bad. this guy, you know, not angry, but still, you know, it was for the CEO. Then later that day, his he hasn't heard anything and his printer's not working. So he decides to go print something over from the IT organization, goes over to the printer, and there's his email to the CEO sitting printed on the printer in the IT organization for this guy. So he's like, ah, so he storms into the CEO's office. How could you forward it to this guy? I you meant that to be private. The guy looks at him, you know, confusedly. He'd been having a problem, I think, with his email or printing and asked IT to troubleshoot it. And so they were <laughs> printing off his emails. So the moral there, which we all need to internalize, is that we should never assume that an email we send someone is private. We should just oh, wow. never assume it's private. He was fine. You know, he, it was fine, but nobody wants to have to work out from under that. Right. I mean, oh, mm, no, I mean, that's yeah, just like, that's, ooh. that's awkward. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's awkward. Cringe. Yeah. Yeah. It's a cringe. I got a lot of cringe worthy stories. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and, so go yes, ahead, go ahead. I was going to throw in a, a question and, um, how many hours, if you can give us a, a some time a type of time frame, do you spend researching the books that you work on, and uh, particularly or specifically this one? Yeah, so it's I, I don't calculate the hours, but I think I gave myself a good. Uh, it was a month of sort of high level research. I was starting. Yeah. I read Cal Newport's book about you know, the end of email and this and that. And then a month of intensive asking my community and looking into studies and really trying to fill the gaps. Um, uh, but so probably a couple months is that I worked on this book because it's a, again a pretty self contained topic. And the fact that you, um, you know, you 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 
put the, the guardrails on what we're doing with the guardrails, with the, good. right? You put guardrails in there. So yeah. it really kept me from going to, I mean, I can really get lost in the research, which is a danger. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't because no, I just needed enough. I couldn't do too much. I couldn't fit in that much. So um, it wasn't the only thing I was doing during that time. Obviously it was alongside other things with my author platform, things like that. So it's, it's hard to put an hour range on it. Um, but I do like to give myself time actually for some of that to filter through my brain and kind of make sense to me too. Yeah. And I know you write a lot about process and uh, more and more, it becomes very clear to me that there are many writers, indie writers that don't take that time. And so that's why I bring it up because your, your research is so um, robust. Yeah. Thanks. It's, it's important to me to do research driven work. I mean, I don't want to just give you, ah, here's my opinions. Here's what I did. I mean, there's value in that. But if I also share with you the opinions of these 400 people and these experts and these studies, then it's a lot more meaningful. Um, yeah. I'm Makes interested sense. in in what you mentioned earlier. You said you looked for uh, what you consider to be the, the smallest kind of atomic piece of business writing that you could find. Can, can you tell me a little bit about that? Like what, what was, why were you looking for something that small that you could break down? Oh, well, again, because I thought, you know, 20,000 words, I don't, I had to find that right balance. It had to be meaty enough to sustain a book, but small enough not to be, you know, I I, I didn't want to get into, um, you know, specifically marketing emails. That's its whole other domain. That's, you know, it, this applies to that, but this is a whole other domain. Um, I wanted it to be really broadly useful to a lot of people and to have a lot of value. Um, so, so that's why small, I think, you know, that, a, a well-defined topic serves the writer so well, right? A really well-defined topic. And I think that's what this, you know, the series gave me the chance to sort of say, well, I didn't want to say business writing. I can't do that in a 20,000 word book. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've been working my whole career on that one. So, mm-hmm. so I can't, I can't put it in 20,000. Some people might, but, but that's just, I can't do it. Um, so I just wanted to come up with a really discreet, and useful and pervasive topic to write about. I mean, you 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 write about podcasting because that's what you do, and it is to you a big pro- big topic, no doubt. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's still is it's defined. It's business podcasting. You're not you're not writing about doing serialized nonfiction or true crime, you know, whatever. I mean, you're being very specific with that, and I think that that serves the reader who wants to find the advice. It serves you as the author. Um, it helps it helps the process. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I would like to ask, because you, you mentioned actionable, um, would you be able to give us some examples of actionable tips from the book? Yes, yes, I would. In fact, I'll give, I'll give you three, all right? So one that's process, one that's technology, and one that's psychology. That's cool. sort of that's sort of them. So the process one, and a lot of people shared this with me, is something that they have learned through hard experience. When you're writing an email, especially a difficult one, don't fill in the two field. That's the last thing you do in an email is address it. Why? Because sometimes we've got stuff going in our head and we address it and we just aren't thinking clearly. I can't tell you how many of those mistakes that people sent me were that they sent the email to the wrong person. They wanted to complain about so-and-so person and they accidentally addressed it to the person they're complaining about or something like that. So That seems so to be amazingly like- common. It's really, really common. You can protect yourself from that by just doing the two field last and use that as a reminder to just be, okay, who really should get this, who needs it and who doesn't, to be thoughtful about who you sent the email to. So that's process. Do that last. Technology is give yourself a bigger safety net. This is something I hadn't done until I was working on this book. Um, With most mail systems, at least on your laptop and desktop, there's a delay there can be a delay. Outlook gives you an adjustable delay. Google email or Gmail gives you a delay before before it actually sends the email and you can undo it and bring it back. (laughs) So I've set mine to 30 seconds. And despite all my other good practices, about once every couple of months, I'm like, oh, wait, undo. I need that 30 second delay to bring back an email that I just was not ready to send. And for some reason I hit send on. So Give yourself a bigger I, I safety I use net. that one all the time. <laughs> all the time. If you haven't done it, you know, it can be up to like 30 seconds on Gmail. And that's a, that's, that should be enough time for you to figure out that you 
have made a an error in judgment. Yeah. Um, and the third I, one is psychology, which mm-hmm. is before you fill in that two field, you've written your email, go back and read the first sentence or two. And nine times out of 10, it's going to start with I. Hi, I wanted to reach out and tell you, I did this, I did that thing, I noticed this, right? This is what we do because we write what's in our head. Swap it and write, you might want to know that the meeting has been changed or you might be interested by this thing that I saw or make it about the recipient. It's such a little thing and it makes such a difference in how the recipient reads the email because now it's not like you blathering on about yourself, but you're telling me something that is relevant to me. Little, tiny little shift. And it has a really big impact if you actually want people to read and pay attention to your emails. And that is a great marketing tip. It is, it's just a great tip for life is yeah. think of, think about other people first and give that priority. I, I think it probably goes back to the Dale Carnegie book and probably two books long before that, but yeah, putting, putting the other person first. Um, yeah. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, Melissa, I'm, I'm interested in, um, knowing the connection between you guys. How, how did you bring, like, why did you think to, to bring Anne on board? How did you know Anne? Well, Anne, I'm I'm trying to remember exactly how we met Anne. Oh, through did we meet through the author ask group? Yep. Or was yep, that's it how okay? We met. And we there's there's a, a wonderful group for um women thought leaders who are publishing and met Anne that way. And her her multiple uh and and uh highly um interesting skill set. Uh, was appealing to me and each time she speaks I go wow I learned something new I'm one of those people that I love to learn new things and you're you have a plethora of new things all the time and and I love you write about process a lot and what I hear from people in business over and over again now is they love systems and they love pro- processes and and once they they adopt uh, ones that are good and useful, it changes their lives. So mm-hmm. I'm always reaching as a publisher for that vision of these wonderful books that help you grow quickly, if you will, and and succeed faster. And and uh, also the the biggest additional benefit with the authors in general have been that they're all so wonderful and it's it, it's been something I never experienced with any of the six or so publishers I published with um, bless them <laughs> they're wonderful but this is more and I wanted something more as a hybrid publisher working in a world where people have constantly um a need to be at that cutting edge of things and to succeed. And that's where we're at. And that's where she's at. (laughs) And she's a, she's a great, great uh, uh, compliment to the series. Uh, Well, you know, I think the, I've learned two things from being part of this. I've learned a lot more than two, but two two big things from writing a book as this series. Um, One was the joy of a short book, right? I think readers enjoy them. They're really actually fun to write because you get to the finish line. If you record the audio book, you know, it doesn't take as long. All of these things are really lovely with a short book. Um, but two is the uh, the community that Melissa has built, how important that has turned out to be to me. Um, I didn't expect to make friends, you know, in this group, but I have. Um, I have always been, I always try to be helpful, but I'm not very good at uh asking for and accepting help, you know, which is something I need to work on. Um, Mm -hmm. And yet being in part of this group is helping me with that. It's teaching me about really relying on the strength of community. Um, And nobody, you know, writing may seem like a lonely endeavor. Writing a book should never be a lonely endeavor. And certainly uh, promoting and getting your ideas out into the world is not something you can do on your own. So being part of this broader community is really wonderful and uh, an unexpected joy from being you bring in the up, You bring up something really important that I didn't think about, which is the people who are, 
are writing and there are many people, there are thousands of books going up on Amazon every day. And the last thing you want, you know, you write and there's a beginning, middle and end, but you mark it forever, right? And having a supportive community who actually gets that process because it's one heck of a process that keeps changing all the time. It's so hard to get people who are right there understanding and able to help you in some way. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's it's, it's, you know, I like to think of it. it it's like someone invited you to, to go for a, a swim. That's a race. And then you pull out of the water at the end thinking you're done. They're like, oh no, this is a triathlon. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's a really that's a good metaphor. Yeah. That's, yeah. And all of a sudden, you know, you're in that last dress. It's like, when is this going to end? Oh, no, you're doing promotion now. It's never going to end. It's like, oh, no. Um, and I think a lot of authors kind of have that feeling when they think it's about, you know, I'm going to write the book and ship it off to the publisher and my life will be joyous. And um, it's, it's you've just done leg one of the triathlon. So, so run that race with friends, you know, so be there with friends, make it a fun run, you know. <laughs> That's right. And we even we even got the group together live, which we missed. We missed you, Anne and mm -hmm. Alistair. And so, you know, as this grows, it, I just think it's going to get more and more interesting. And my one of my lines when I was out on the speaking circuit, when I was uh, promoting my my books at that time, um, I would always say I want to go pl places and take as many people with me as I can. Well, here it is. <laughs> this is That's great. This is the the trajectory I think we're on. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's a, a good place to wrap it up. Yeah. Um. So thank you both for being on this first uh, episode of the Thirty Three Ways Not to Screw Up podcast. Thank um, you for having a podcast. <laughs> yes, and showing we're, us how it's done. It. Yes. <laughs> and, yes. And thank you, listener. Uh, for listening. Uh, you can find more episodes and you can find Anne's book and the rest of the series at 33waysseries.com. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. And before you turn that off and before we stop, you have got to share the title of your book. Yeah. And, and the title of my book is 33 Ways Not to Screw Up Your Business Podcast. Hey. So you'll be hearing about that very soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.